Um, welcome uh, to this uh, Treasury Corner for on behalf of the Blockchain and Crypto Treasury Management Working Group. Um, uh, I'm Manolis. Uh, you might uh, not all of you know uh, know me. I am uh, working at the moment in the European Commission in the Treasury back office team. I have a background in uh, Treasury teams uh, in other corporates before joining the Commission. And before that, I used to I had I have some uh, experience in the post trade activities as I was part of Euroclear Bank. But uh, throughout uh, all these years, I was always interested in innovation in technology and uh, blockchain and bodies. Uh, all this uh, in my for my interests. And uh, I think after this presentation, you will also have a better idea of what uh, blockchain is. So the question of the day, what is a blockchain? So blockchain is a, a system of recording, of storing, of exchanging information, data in, in blocks, as it mentions from the name, that are, are part of a, a chain, as you can imagine, and they are, uh, they are stored in a chronological order, meaning that uh, whenever you record or you make any transaction in, into the blockchain, it is recorded into a single block that is uh, part of a block uh, of, a, of a chain and it is distributed uh, to many different ledgers instantly and they have all of these uh, different uh, ledgers they have the same uh, level of information and uh, to be more specific um, uh, all these data that as i mentioned before that they are in blocks they are also connected between themselves and they are also connected with the and you can also refer to each specific uh, block of data with uh, their own reference and uh, with this uh, reference you can also uh, identify where this block is standing on the chain and uh, to, to be more specific and to, to explain you a bit uh, better what is uh, what is uh, why it's so important and so I would say revolutionary this idea is because this data is not stored in a single and a central server as we are all used to our lives like uh, for our personal data or in general for any kind of or for any data that we have uh, stored the data now is is uh, stored in the shared ledger it is based the data storage is based on the shared ledger technology and as you will see on the next slide, it is saved in many different uh, um, servers or computers or the, the so-called knobs. So um, as you can see here, uh, all the data are processed and they are part of the of the chain. And uh, they are part. Uh, the, the method of recording all this data is uh, in the in the. Um, in the level, in the, I would say, how can I say that to make it more uh, clear for all of you? They are not stored in a single uh, clearing house, as you can see. I have the example of, of a bank on the left side, which works exactly like it is uh, it, on the picture. We have a centralized ledger that uh, represents the, the true state of uh, all the transactions that happen. So most of you, maybe all of you, you have done reconciliation in the past. You have your own side, you have the bank side, then you need to reconcile. And sometimes that you have discrepancies, you need to convince the bank who has the, let's say, the correct uh, representation of the truth. And you spend a lot of time for reconciliation every day. Sometimes you spend even more time to, uh, to find the discrepancies. So this process, although it's, it's the standard for, for our business, it's not optimal. While on the other side, on the blockchain recording of data, there is only one ledger that it's uh, the same across the whole community, meaning that everyone who has access on the blockchain has the same representation of the truth uh, of the data that has been exchanged. Either this is a bank data statement, either this is a, an ID details, either this is a transaction of the cryptocurrency, uh, this uh, data is uh, transparent to all the users and it's also visible to each one of us. And this is the big difference of uh, and the big re revolutionary idea behind the, the blockchain. The big, the big, I would say, uh, gain that we get from using such technology. 
and maybe to to add uh, 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 something more about this uh, maybe it looks very secure but uh, it's still not yet that popular and still not uh, adopted uh, massively from the market and of course this is because uh, the market sometimes is uh, hesitant to to make such big changes but uh, it's, this is my personal opinion i believe that in in the future in some years we will uh, we will have uh, big changes we will have to we will see these changes to come uh, in every level of our lives, not only in the financial part, but in general. So, uh, moving to the next uh, topic, something that it's quite, uh, I would say, interesting. It's I, I tried to create a, a slide that uh, will show you step by step what are the what are the steps that uh, every transaction blockchain has to, to complete in order to be processed? So let's say you have uh, some uh, data, some uh, files, some even cryptocurrencies that you would like to exchange with some of your, with, with another stakeholder, with uh, your counterparty. Uh, firstly, you, you need to, to insert your your wish that you need you you when you want to, to make this exchange you have to send this transaction uh, as a block to the blockchain so this transaction is represented uh, online in in terms of uh, in, inside of a block of the blockchain afterwards this block that you have uh, inserted is broadcasted to every party in the network so everyone has this information on their on their side on their uh, i would say on their server and then uh, those in the networks, uh, they approve your transaction. And it's not approved only by one person. It's approved by many people simultaneously, and they are called the miners. Maybe you have heard uh, this uh, terminology in your life because uh, it's quite popular nowadays to hear about uh, um, this, um, uh, this uh, terminology and uh, it's it's a, m a very big reason why the graphics cards for the people that my might not might know the graphics cards for the computers are so expensive i will come back later to explain you what what are the miners you know, what they are exactly doing so when once the miners approve the transaction then the block that uh, in includes our information is added to the chain of the whole blockchain which then is uh, recorded, it's inedible, it's fully transparent to everyone and it, it is impossible to, to change or to alter because even if you hack, if you manage to hack, let's say, the chain, it is, uh, it is in 20 different or 50 different uh, stakeholders, which is impossible to, to, to hack all this at the same time all, this, all the stakeholders. This is why it's so uh, secure, this uh, system. And as soon as the block is transmitted, then it's, uh, it's uh, is uh, added to the chain. Then the transaction is complete, and the documents or the the information you would like to exchange is uh, is completed, is processed. So coming back to the miners uh, topic, uh, the miners uh, it's usually private people like maybe you and me, or it can be also companies that they can do that, that they have very powerful graphics cards. And they are borrowing by they are they have some programs that they run on their personal computers and they are borrowing let's say to the system to the blockchain the computing power of the graphics cards in order for the, the system to be able to approve these transactions this is why the graphics cards and nowadays they are so expensive it's because also the the, the miners that they approve all these payments they receive uh, like a, in terms of, like a fee for their services. So the higher and the more expensive these um, uh, cryptocurrencies are that they are processing, the more profits they gain, and consequently they spend much more in graphics card that affects the market. Unfortunately, is it clear for all of you what uh, the miners uh, and in general what are the steps? If, if something is not clear, you can uh, intervene. You can ask me. I'm, I'm, I'm flexible. OK. One question by me. By yes. Uh, no. When you see they are the they are the buyers, the miners approve each transaction. What, what yes. kind of approval do they provide? Uh, they don't do anything on their own. It's all everything is automatic. So they just basically 
borrow the computing uh, power of the graphics card. So the, the, everything is done automatically, but the, the whole blockchain needs some computing power to process these transactions. Somewhere uh, we need a, a computer to process all this flow because uh, there is no central computer in this case. So you borrow from the users, let's say the central, uh, the, the computing power. And in terms, uh, because in, in, in return of providing this computing power, they receive back some uh, fees that uh, its user pays for these transactions, which is very small. But uh, in uh, overall, uh, I mean, because they, they approve a lot of payments per day, and not only payments, transactions in general, they get something in return back for that. But everything is automatically, they don't have to go to click approve or something like that, uh, if you imagine something like that. You don't, they don't do anything, actually. They don't touch the computer at all. It just works on its own. Okay, clear. And a second question. Mm -hmm. You said that uh, in the beginning, each uh, transaction is being communicated to all the available miners yes. in, the, in the network. So it means that it is uh, the, the same transaction is stored in several servers uh, Correct, across yes. the network. Yes, 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 exactly. So each, each server across the network has the same let's say, load of Information. Uh, transactions stored? Yes, exactly. So each server it can be a miner. It can be a private person like me who is a miner and can have all the information for all the uh, transactions that you approved. So it's impossible to breach that because even if you manage to hack one of the, of the miners, for example, uh, network, it will not match with the rest of the block of the, of the chain, so it will be automatically rejected. This is why it's so secure. It's, uh, it's decentralized completely, the, the logic. Is okay, it? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yes, thanks for your question. And then for the next uh, uh, important, I believe, uh, Topic is we need to go back to the history of blockchain and uh, it has to be done through Bitcoin. And some people confuse Bitcoin with blockchain. It's completely different uh, uh, topics and uh, instruments. Uh, Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency, the first cryptocurrency. Bit a blockchain is the channel that allows all these transactions to happen and not only for cryptocurrencies, but in general exchange of data. But uh, we give, uh, let's say, an attribute, and uh, this is why I have this uh, slide uh, for Bitcoin. It's because of Bitcoin, uh, blockchain is what it is today. It's because of uh, Bitcoin, uh, blockchain became so, so popular. So from 2008 that Bitcoin was created, uh, two years uh, later that was, uh, exchanged in, that was uh, inserted in the crypto exchange, and as you can see throughout the years, the, the price of the Bitcoin skyrocket. I, I, I don't think I have to mention anything about this. You, you know, you have heard the news, uh, you know the story about it. The, a big uh, attribute for all this success of uh, blockchain is because of Bitcoin. OK, uh, this year is not a good year for to discuss about cryptocurrencies, but in general, as an idea, it was quite uh, revolutionary. And by the way, this presentation is not to give you investment ideas or to promote the use of uh, cryptocurrencies. It's just uh, to explain you it's like an introduction and educational, mostly the, this uh, presentation. So why we, would we need the blockchain and why we believe that uh, it will be a very efficient solution for the future and even for, uh, for our current uh, daily life. First of all, it cuts the middleman. You don't have to rely on a bank, on an intermediary bank or, a, or an, on a central service that might be offline, not uh, for the banks, but in general, I mean. You can have a, a straight through process directly uh, through a peer-to-peer -peer network. So you can connect directly with a counterparty that you need to exchange information or you need to exchange uh, any kind of data. Uh, this information is consistent across all the participants that are uh, taking part of the, on the blockchain environment. And uh, also it's uh, visible for everyone in the, in the group. 
uh, and uh, you have full transparency transparency of all the transactions so it is uh, really hard to have uh, a breach of data or even to to have uh, like uh, as i mentioned before to be hacked and to have uh, I mean, the, the security in the blockchain is one of the main reasons why it is so popular and so successful so far. It's, it was not, it's not yet massively adopted, but uh, from my opinion, I believe that we are at a stage that it starts to get more and more ground, to gain more and more ground. Uh, some other reasons why, again, blockchain can be very, very useful for the future is also for the transactions, as you can see, because uh, Nowadays, if, if you are in Europe and you want to make a transaction, let's say in the US or in the Brazil in, or in much more difficult countries like, I don't know, in Africa, uh, you need to spend a lot of time and you need to wait uh, at least one day to get your funds settled, sometimes two days, depending on the currency. While if you need to transfer a cryptocurrency to, to these countries, you, it will take you maximum 10 minutes, 5 to 10 minutes to, for the full end-to-end -end process to complete. Also for the bank fees, if you want to transfer any kind of funds from anywhere in the world, it will take much less fees. You will avoid the conversion fees because you will send directly to the, to the person you want to send uh, in the currency they need. And it is also almost impossible if you want to make a small transaction uh, cross uh, currency uh, because of the, the fees and the conversion fees that you will face from the banks. Uh, it will be next to impossible. Something that I did not add here, but uh, you noticed, uh, maybe you, you noticed in the latest, uh, latest months, is that even it can be, it can have uh, the blockchain and especially the cryptocurrencies can have even humanitarian reason. And uh, that's why, for example, you saw uh, Ukraine that uh, opened uh, accounts for receiving crypto because they had uh, issues on receiving uh, funds um, from everywhere in the world. And this helped a lot and they received a lot of funds uh, with this way. So it's also an, an alternative tool for such occasions. It's not the ideal scenario, but it's still there is a solution for such uh, situations. And uh, to make it a, a bit more broader of uh, what are the usages of uh, blockchain, as you can see here, um, the variety of applications is vast for the blockchain application. I, I, I spoke a lot about the cryptocurrencies, but uh, it's, uh, the cryptos are just a small part of what uh, the blockchain uh, has uh, is capable of. You can. Uh, for example, store your data for your land there. You can, uh, it's, it's very easy and very secure for storing ID details. Uh, it's, it's very, it will be a very good solution for even for doing, uh, for completing uh, elections for countries uh, online, fully online. It, it is very, I, I will not go through the full uh, use case that you can uh, uh, perform uh, on blockchain because as you can see, there are so many. But uh, you, you get a rough idea of um, how, uh, how, uh, what, what are the capabilities of such, uh, of such uh, applications of, of blockchain. And uh, I will just uh, give you a rough, uh, ta a small taste uh, with three key studies that I've noticed that are worth mentioning. One is the ID Pass that uh, it's called ID Pass, which is a blockchain based. Uh, uh, application that is uh, uh, designed to store identities for people that they have uh, no access in, uh, in I would say, um, in, in their own municipalities. Some people, I would say, uh, from this, uh, uh, based on this uh, ID pass, they mentioned that one seventh of the global population is not registered somewhere on their, on their records of their of their city, they have no rights like medical access or uh, uh, um, educational access. And this application has been created because uh, it's very secure and you can have uh, like, a, a, like a card, like a bank card with a chip to have all your details there. And it is working offline and all the data is stored uh, 
on the on the chip and also on the blockchain uh, environment and it's much more secure than having everything in a single server and so far they are already uh, uh, implementing this for population like uh, refugees and in countries that they have uh, issues on recording their population uh, another very interesting uh, application that is uh, running on blockchain is the so-called EVA, which is a ride sharing application. And uh, what is uh, really um, revolutionary about this idea is that whenever they make a transaction, uh, the, the client and the, the driver, 85% of uh, the fee goes directly to the driver. So no intermediary, no banks are involved, nothing. And the rest, 15% uh, is kept by the service for the maintenance of the network and for the and also for the for the treasury activities of the of this uh, application. And last but not least is the GenoS, which is again a, a blockchain uh, application that is storing uh, DNA data and uh, sleep patterns. And in general, if you have, for example, a Garmin or a Fitbit. Uh, that stores all, all of your data for your sleep quality and all this uh, useful for some people information for your general overall wellness. This is a similar application, but it's, everything is stored in a blockchain environment and not in a central server. And uh, I believe that the future for storing data will be a setup like that. Okay, then. Uh, Moving on to the next topic, which are the types of blockchain, because uh, we, we saw how many, what are the capabilities of blockchain, but uh, there are two types of blockchain that are um, created so far. It's the permission and the permissionless. As you can understand from the title, one has less, I would say, freedom than the other. And this is, as you can see, for the reasons uh, below, uh, the permission the blockchain uh, needs uh, more um, more data from your side you need to be verified it's private but it's much faster because it's i would say more exclusive and uh, there is a, a way that you are protected by the the network that you are in on the other side on the uh, permissionless uh, the, the the blockchain is completely anonymous Every, anyone can join and make transactions in this uh, uh, network, but it is much lower because it's much bigger than the permission the one. So the next uh, topic that uh, uh, it is quite, uh, I would say, characteristic for the blockchain uh, uh, to, to understand uh, the blockchain uh, um, um, mindset is the block blockchain trilemma, which is basically uh, the perfect, uh, the goal, the ultimate goal of blockchain. What is the ultimate goal of blockchain? And uh, the, the, the perfect blockchain will have the perfect decentralization, will have the perfect scalability and the perfect security. Unfortunately, at the moment, every blockchain that is available in the, in the world has two of them perfect and the, the third has a compromise. But once this problem is solved, once we have everything uh, perfectly fine, then we will have uh, we will we will be confident that blockchain will be uh, adopted by the market massively. I hope it will happen soon because the, the trend of the market is also through through the, um, to this direction, as you will see later on. So, switching topics now to the. DeFi, it's, it's called DeFi um, as, an, uh, as a part of uh, blockchain and DeFi stands for decentralized finance, which uh, is basically, uh, it means that uh, everything, all the information that you exchange in the blockchain does not pass through any uh, central exchange. Maybe you have heard of uh, central exchanges like Binance or Coinbase or very famous cryptocurrency exchanges. These are examples of centralized finance in uh, blockchain, meaning that uh, all the, the transactions and everything that you 
you exchange between you and, uh, and the other stakeholders and their counterparties are passing through this central exchange. Um, for the moment, uh, uh, it's not that I, I, I'm, I'm more into the DeFi or more to the CFI. They will both, they coexist, both of them. And uh, it's not that uh, one of them will prevail on the other. They will, I think they will continue to coexist. Uh, and what are the, their differences? Their main differences is that uh, uh, when you have, uh, the, the, when you are in the DeFi um, uh, exchange, when you have your, um, I would say, when you exchange your uh, cryptos or you have your data or you have your, your files in, in a blockchain that is decentralized, you really own your funds. While on the other side, when you are in the centralized uh, blockchain, all the funds are part, are, they are um, ownership of the of this centralized uh, exchange that you, you have, uh, you are um, registered and you have, uh, you manage them. I, I would say that uh, you create the instructions to manage them. Of course, the, the services are slightly better in the centralized finance, but still you can make uh, pretty much everything. Uh, you can do everything you can imagine with a decentralized environment. The security depends on yours, on you, on the technology that you are using to exchange your data. And uh, of course, uh, on the other side, it is depending on the, uh, on, for the centralized finance, it depends on the security of the central exchange that, uh, that is uh, that has uh, stored your data or your funds or your cryptos, for example. And uh, uh, the basics that uh, the DeFi is uh, is uh, is created is the cryptography that uh, all the cryptos uh, are created. It's the blockchain, of course, because this is the the mean of trans tra uh, of moving and uh, circulating all this information. The so-called smart contracts. What are the smart contracts? A smart contract is basically like you can imagine it's like a physical contract, but it's digital and it is activated when certain conditions conditions are met. Like, uh, for example, uh, um, you are making a transaction that you want to exchange the land or something. And uh, as soon as the transaction of, of the, the funds is completed, then this smart contract is activated under your name. It's like you can say, you can imagine it as an automated uh, contract that has some uh, rules that uh, activate it based on these rules. And uh, all these smart contracts are the, um, the fundamental for all the coins, the cryptocurrency coins that are generated. Uh, they, they have to be to exist in order to, to describe and to create such uh, crypto currency coins. Is it clear for you so far? Because maybe I'm going uh, too fast or uh, I'm not explaining in a way that you can understand. I don't know. If not, you can uh, interrupt me. There's no problem for that. Okay, I hear total silence, so I can move on. That's good. <laughs> so DeFi uh, decentralized finance is based on five pillars, which are the stable coins uh, and the, the stable coins means that they are supposed to be stable. Supposed to because they are not as it uh, this for personally speaking, I believe that this uh, name has been abused for from some of the coins and we will speak about that on the next uh, two slides. And this anyway, uh, these coins that are so called the uh, stable coins, they are supposed to follow the price of the so-called fiat currencies. Fiat currencies, in case you don't know, they are the uh, currencies of the main uh, central banks like USD, U Euro, uh, GBP, Chinese uh, won, and etc. etc. And uh, these uh, stable coins, they are supposed to be always equal, for example, to one US dollar or to one Euro. And they are uh, tools in order to make transactions from your personal uh, Euro uh, conversions into any cryptocurrency you want. They are used for such purposes and also sometimes just to to hedge your risk. There are two types of, uh, of stable coins, the algorithmic and non-algorithmic that we will discuss about this on the next slide. The other four pillars <coughs> are the capability to lend and borrow that you can do 
uh, in a decentralized platform. You can borrow funds uh, with by paying interest, of course. The fact that you have a decentralized exchange that you can make uh, transactions through a peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, you can have uh, your uh, you can have uh, insurance against uh, any kind of smart contract failures in, in case of uh, issues with your transactions. You you can still have an insurance that will protect you. And also something that is mostly for traders, you can do margin trading for transactions that uh, if, if you want to have like a, a minimal uh, profits, but in a very small amount of time, it's something similar that the traders are doing also for the stock market. It, it is also a possibility also for the decentralized finance. So um, yes, so moving to the next uh, slide, as I mentioned before, the stable coins are uh, uh, distinguish between two categories, the non-algorithmic and the algorithmic. The non-algorithmic ones, uh, they are the ones that they have a collateral uh, for each uh, single currency, single coin that exists. So, for example, the USDC, which is the biggest non-algorithmic uh, stable coin in cryptos, has uh, for behind the, uh, the, the scenes has uh, one US dollar for each coin that is uh, existed, that is minted. So you have zero risk practically for losing your funds or to be affected by the market because it will always be covered. On the other hand, the algorithmic uh, uh, stable coins are collateralized by a mix of several cryptocurrencies that are deposited uh, in, in the form of smart uh, contract and uh, they are deposited in the form of uh, smart contracts as I mentioned and they are spread across different cryptocurrencies and this is uh, in, instead of using US dollar they are just using multiple cryptocurrencies as a collateral and there is an algorithm that automatically uh, regulates this uh, relationship through a smart contract in order to keep them always stable at one US dollar. But uh, um, uh, we had a, a very serious problem uh, two months ago about uh, the Luna uh, end. And do, do you have any idea, some of you, what happened to Luna? Do you follow the news about uh, the Terra collapse? Does any one of you has any idea what happened? No. Okay, so yes, so I can explain you. Terra was a, a stable coin like, uh, like the ones before, uh, like for example the DAI, that was supposed to be always equal to one US dollar. The problem uh, was that uh, it had one uh, the problem that was not the problem the algorithm it has an algorithm that uh, there was another cryptocurrency which was called luna which was uh, correlated with this terra that was supposed to be always one us dollar and uh, the value of luna was depending on the demand of terra so it was not stable so when for example the value of the terra was below it was like 0 0.95 cents of a dollar the algorithm was activated and was creating more Luna in order for uh, the people to start buying Luna because it will drop, because it will be cheaper then, and to exchange their Luna for Terra for one US dollar. And then they would get a profit of 95 cents, of, of sorry, of five cents because it was 95. Uh, it was dropped to 95. Then, uh, because the demand of Terra will in start to increase, it will go back to one uh, US dollar. And the same on the other side. If the Terra was going more than one US dollar, the algorithm will start to burn Luna in order to create the demand for people to sell the Terra and buy Luna. The problem was that uh, the, the trust was lost on Terra. So most people were selling Terra because they thought that it will collapse, which is what ha which is what happened, and started to go below 80, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.4, and then the algorithm that was creating the Luna, it was so many Lunas that uh, it co completely collapsed and it never rebounded. And uh, the problem was that uh, a lot of people lost a lot of money and the trust in uh, stable coins was completely, I would say, it was lost for some days 
So that's why uh, you will see the reason DAI, the, the biggest one at the moment, algorithm is uh, collateralized in a mix of several cryptocurrencies and not only one because of this big uh, problem. I hope it is a bit clear for you what happened. And uh, yes, now we change completely topic because uh, I believe we spend a lot of time on the uh, stable coins and I really hope it is uh, a bit clear for all of you, what is uh, what is the purpose of of these stable coins? It's basically to hedge your risk, and I, I would like to spend some time on the and the trend of the of the years, let's say, then of the years to come, because uh, um, the central banks uh, in the whole world basically are exploring the possibility to offer the so-called uh, central bank digital currencies. And uh, that's because they see also, they also realize the capabilities of uh, blockchain. And what are, what are these uh, digital currencies? They are pegged to the value of their fiat currency, of, of their central bank currencies. And uh, of course, they are uh, regularized uh, by their central uh, authority, their central bank. And uh, they are not anonymized as uh, some of the cryptocurrencies uh, do, because of course they are controlled by this central bank. They are exploring it because, uh, especially for countries that they have financial instability, it might be a very useful tool for the future. And uh, as uh, you will see, there are two types of uh, digital currencies that exist for the moment. The wholesale and the retail. The wholesale uh, are the ones that are primarily used for by financial institutions and central banks, and they are like the reserves that we have uh, in the central banks. While uh, the retail type of uh, um, central bank digital tokens are the ones that are, will be used by us and by businesses, and they will be based on token-based retail, which it mentions it is anonymous, but it will not be anonymous uh, like you will think that it will be. As soon as you connect this token in, in a web service provider, it will be back to, it will be verified, it will be digitalized uh, with your details because it is a digital currency and it is controlled by the central government. And the other type of uh, retail will be the account based retail, which will require a digital verification in order to make transactions with this uh, digital currency. And uh, what is the, the status uh, at the moment uh, for this um, for the di digital currencies? As you can see, um, basically the whole world is exploring uh, this option. As you, Ninety-five percent of the global GDP is exploring uh, the digital currencies. Uh, two years ago, it was only 35 countries that were considering uh, such solution. And in just of just two years, we saw such a huge growth. And uh, 50 countries of them are already in a high, in advanced phase, and are ready basically to become to launch or to enter the pilot mode. So as you can see, uh, the trend uh, at the moment it's there. Not only in, um, I would say, in some uh, cryptocurrency exchanges, but also the central banks have realized the value of the blockchain, and you can see the results uh, at the moment. And why they are uh, why they are considering such uh, such option? Uh, the key points uh, that help them and convince them to explore. First of all, uh, I want to to mention that ten countries have already launched uh, their digital currencies. Jamaica was the last one, and uh, China, which is the biggest country that is ready to to enter the launch. Uh, uh, to, to launch their own digital currency will uh, it's still on pilot mode but it will be they expect to be live in 2023 and other countries that uh, other countries that are exploring these alternative solutions are the ones that they are facing financial sanctions like uh, Russia and of course this will help them a lot to to make uh, international uh, international payments uh, much easier than before uh, from the G7 countries, uh, US and UK are uh, they have advanced uh, quite a lot, and uh, 
the European Central Bank has announced uh, last uh, summer that they will start uh, creating the digital euro. It will take them approximately two years to complete their their um, their assessment, and by they expect by the middle of the, the decade, by 2025, to have it uh, released and uh, available for the public, the digital euro. And uh, the, I mentioned a bit more about this because I think it will affect a lot uh, our lives in the near future. And uh, something else, also it's very important that uh, from the top 20 in the G20 countries, 19 of them are already in development or pilot stage. And uh, I believe that uh, uh, with this, uh, uh, these developments, uh, there will be an urgency to create a new international standard, a new set, because we will have a complete, uh, a, a very big change of, uh, of uh, our daily transactions and our, the way the, the transactions are settled in the future. So why all these countries are uh, um, developing their digital currencies? I believe uh, you have already an idea what are the benefits from this uh, idea, from these uh, projects, from these projects. It's first of all, they will promote their own, uh, um, their own uh, capabilities as a central bank. They will promote their market. They will, I would say, advertise that their access for uh, for money, it's uh, easier and they will make it ac more accessible for even for people that they have no banking access for especially for populations that uh, in Africa that they have very limited uh, access to to funds and uh, to banks, for example, maybe it will be a very good alternative for all of them. And of course, it, it will uh, increase and improve the competition between um, the banks that they might offer much better services, much faster services and uh, much cheaper, of course. And, and I know that in Greece it's not very efficient, the transaction part, uh, especially between different banks. It's something that uh, it needs to be addressed. And uh, maybe with this kind of tool, with the digital euro, it this will help to have uh, uh, very, very low transaction costs for payments uh, between different banks or even different countries. And uh, yes, of course, it, it's very important to to have a, a very robust process that uh, will improve the transparency of the money flows. And that, of course, they need to create the monetary physical policy that will make it easy for each one of us and not to create a regulatory burden or to make it very, very um, uh, hard to implement such a project. We will see. I, I'm pretty optimistic that it will uh, come uh, in the next few years and it will. Uh, we will have some improvements on our daily lives. But uh, what are the challenges of such um, uh, project. First of all, especially in countries that uh, have unstable financial systems, like uh, in some African countries or in Venezuela, for example, if they implement such, <coughs> sorry, such uh, tools, such digital currencies, maybe some people will go massively to the banks to to change or to trans tra to move their funds from their, <coughs> sorry, to their actual. Um, and to the actual, I would say, currency to the digital currency, they, it can also have, carry some operational risks since it will be a new project, a new, uh, a new workflow, a new tool that uh, might be at the beginning vulnerable to attacks. So it needs to be very, very carefully designed and created by this by the central banks. And of course, it will uh, require at the beginning at least a very complex uh, framework to be designed as efficient as possible, of course, but uh, at the beginning, as like everything uh, that has been created at the first stage, it will always be harder to implement and much harder to to make it uh, efficient. Of course, uh, as time is passing and uh, the, the technology is becoming more and more mature, we will have uh, even better, even more benefits on, on that, from that technology. So, um, 
in order to sum up uh, what does all this information and all these uh, developments mean for you i will just uh, as you can see there are so many aspects of finance that are affected that will be affected or can be affected already um, from your daily work uh, life because uh, if if you uh, if you have a pay a lot of, if you have uh, followed the full presentation you will see that uh, blockchain has uh, so many different aspects and so many applications that uh, it can uh, uh, it can improve that and it uh, can also make it uh, make them even more safe and even more efficient that uh, I believe that there are a lot of options out there even now in the market that you can use in order to to make your daily life basically a little bit more easy and uh, a little bit more uh, uh, automated, if you can say that. Of course, depending on the level of, uh, of, of your nature, of your needs and uh, depending also on uh, what exactly you want to approve. Maybe for some of you, you cannot find something useful from these uh, applications, but I think for some of you, you can find something uh, out of this uh, of these developments that can help you on your daily work life. Uh, and uh, yes, as you can see, something that uh, immediately comes in mind is the self-validation of sub-ledgers for receivables and payables, even for automatic uh, automated reconciliation can be something that can be improved in the future. But in general, uh, for uh, document management, for fraud and risk det det uh, detection, there are many aspects of finance that you can explore and uh, you can find you can have some gains so what uh, it might uh, be in the future uh, what we see for the future for blockchain is uh, i believe from what i have uh, seen that it will be very very popular for managing the data for our uh, digital identities uh, it will be very very um, it will be widely used from governments or from companies to, to store our data there because it's really secure. And uh, the, uh, the more the technology is becoming, uh, the blockchain is becoming more and more mature, it will be even, the, the security will be improved even more. So it will be, if not impossible, like incredibly difficult for, hack, for hackers to, to affect uh, the data that is stored inside. Okay, another aspect that uh, we have already spoke uh, a lot about it, it's the cryptocurrencies. Um, it will, uh, the market is expected to grow. It has already grown a lot, but uh, okay, the experts say that they expect to grow for 45%. I'm not so sure, but uh, I believe still that it will grow. I, I don't, uh, I, I learn not to believe what I see and what I hear about the prices of uh, any kind of cryptocurrencies because they are almost always wrong. Um, another uh, topic that I didn't touch because um, it's not, I think, uh, really relevant to our goal. It's the NFTs, which are, I would say, the digital artworks that you can buy online with cryptos and if you see some a picture of something that you really like, you can buy it and you can keep it and it belongs only to you and you can even sell it at one point if you really want it. Something else that it will be very, very useful and I believe that it will be used uh, in the future from governments is to vote through online and via blockchain. And uh, for sure, similar to the digital identity, it's a very powerful tool that uh, it's very, very secure. Last but not least, uh, verification of KYC, as it will, as it is linked also to the digital identity storage, as uh, you will have all your data there, it will be almost instant, or maybe it can be also automatically verified. Sorry, through a smart contract, you can have your KYC verification completed immediately, instead of sometimes having to wait a few days from the banks, for example, to verify your KYC. So this, I, I think that these are, I would say, the realistic goals for blockchain to be completed in the future. But of course, time will show us. And uh, I, I would like to close um, this presentation with uh, this uh, slide, which is what we can do to prepare ourselves the best we can for blockchain. 
And I believe that uh, first of all, we need always to identify. Uh, maybe this presentation will trigger your curiosity and it will start uh, looking for ideas and opportunities that you can use even on your daily uh, life. But I believe it's very important to be curious, not only for blockchain in general, but also for blockchain, uh, what we can get out of this uh, new technology. Uh, it's also very important to continue to learn as the technology is growing and developing, developing and uh, maybe in two years from now we will have the blockchain 2.0, which will be something completely different. I don't know, but we, I think we need always to be to stay, I would say, hungry for more, for more knowledge. Another thing that uh, we need to pay uh, to pre uh, that will help to prepare for blockchain is to identify what are the demands, what are our demands and how can we get uh, a benefit from the blockchain applications. Of course, to make uh, use of all the outside specialized vendors, if we find out that we can have a vendor that use uh, that can help us based on the blockchain technology or in general. And the uh, last but not least, the most important for the whole uh, from the whole slide is to listen and engage with others in your industry, like the HAT or other organization. I believe uh, being part of such uh, association, it's only a benefit for all of us. And uh, with that, uh, yes, I would like to, to thank you very much for your time, for your attention. And uh, that's all from my side. And uh, if you have any questions, if you want to go through something together, uh, yeah, please f feel free to to comment. Just to clarify something, I'm not an expert of blockchain. Uh, everything that you saw here was uh, a knowledge that uh, I, I acquired together with the rest of the team members during the meetings that we had. And, uh, basically, most of the knowledge was acquired through this uh, very useful meeting. So. I tried my best to explain you what uh, what we are doing, what is blockchain, but uh, if you have any gaps or you feel that you need something extra, let me know. Or you